This episode of the Oh No 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 podcast is sponsored by Dynamic Industrial Services, the Rope Access Specialists. The roof of the south stand at Starch Park is some 19 metres above the pitch, the same height as 11 Aidan Connollys. But as we all know, there's only one Aidan Connolly, and so you'd be much better off with Dynamic Industrial Services. DIS specialise in working at height, offering a range of services including maintenance, inspection and repair. To find out more, visit dynamicindustrialservices.co.uk The Rovers returned to Hamden Park this weekend, and I think it's fair to say that it never quite reached the excitement levels of our last visit. Uh, Jack Hamilton's thumping header and Ross Millen's chipped penalty might well have been the combined moments that truly confirmed that the Rovers were in a title race, but this low-key nil-nil wasn't quite the result that we wanted. It does look all but guaranteed that the championship title race will go down to the wire. Um, so my name is Duncan Cameron, and to talk through this one today, I am joined by uh, Leslie Maybon. First of all, uh, how are you, Les? Much better, having been out the house for 14 hours to see a nil-nil draw, having just gone on Twitter and reading about that Rangers fan from Wales and his son who were on an overnight bus to find the game at Dundee had been called off. <laughs> it, yeah, it's not funny, is it? It's a little bit yeah, funny. Not. <laughs> it wouldn't be funny if it was you. But then that's, no. that's what you get for being a Rangers supporter, uh, exactly. in my opinion. Um, we've also got Scott Fleming. Uh, how are you, Scott? Yeah, not too bad. And as you say, we're uh, kind of getting right down to the nitty gritty sort of stuff now with seven games to go. So pressure's ramping up. It's all about who can uh, who can cope with it better. And I, don't mean, I know who I'm backing. And um, <laughs> we've also got Blair Hopcroft too. How are you, Blair? Very well, mate. Very well. Looking forward to this. Excellent. So the the kind of big news ahead of this one came courtesy of our uh, our good friends. Uh, well, <laughs> it's like James McPake, good guy. Matty Todd, good guy. Alex Jakubiak, never said a bad word about him. Uh, Kane Ritchie Hosler does stuff. There we go. Um, so the Pars beat Dundee United three one on Friday night, as uh, as welcome as it was unexpected. Um, so that. You know, presented a, a big opportunity for the Rovers yesterday. Um, Blair, before we actually get into the the ins and outs of the game and the fact that nobody won a t shirt trying to pick the, the world's <laughs> most difficult lineup, um, in your opinion, does coming away with uh, just a draw go down as a missed opportunity this weekend? Um, to an extent, I think it does. Um, I think it has to. Um, Especially the nature of the draw. Um, and in a weird way, and I know we'll kind of go through the details of the game, but I'm not as annoyed as I would have been because I feel like we we created chances, we had really good opportunities and we just couldn't get the ball over the line. Um, I mean, you go back to the Morton game, the last nil nil that we had, where it was not like that at all. Do you know what I mean? Nothing happened for 90 minutes. Um, that wasn't the case yesterday. So I don't think it was a case of us... You know, bottling it as as every Dundee United fan on their uh, Twitter account would have you believe. Um, I don't think it was that at all. I think it was just the nature of the game, a decent side, and um, all in all, probably a decent point. Um, whether it turns out that way at the end of the season, we'll wait and see. But um, yeah, missed opportunity, but not too dejected by it. Yeah, Scott, you've um, you said before you know, a point away, a point on the road in the championships, never a bad result. Sticking by that after yesterday. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, we'd pretty much said on it, I think it might have been yourself that had said uh, in our group chat that like, a point is a good result in the Championship, but also it, it depends on how everything else has panned out in terms of Dundee United played the night before. So it, it maybe to some people didn't look as good a result, but at the same time, a clean sheet and a point on the road is pretty decent in the Championship. It, 
I just think that some folk need to put into persp- perspective that at times the Rovers are going to drop points this season and we've showed that we have sometimes in more bizarre fashions than others but like I think it's just the fact that people have been spoilt this season and some people have clearly been coming this season that haven't even been going for season after season because we've got two and a half thousand nearly more than what we had for years there so I think some people yeah they need to maybe realise that uh, the lads are giving us one hell of an effort this season so I think uh, yeah I, I wasn't buzzing that we drew nil nil yesterday but at the same time we're now we're now level so I think if you'd given me that last Saturday before the Dunfermline game that we would gain the four points under the United I'd probably well I'd definitely have taken that that's it. If we if we pick up a, a point more than Dundee United every weekend between now and the end of the season, then uh, you know we'll, we'll be pretty happy with that. I think a lot of it it comes into timing as much as anything. Um, you know, I, I put this on Twitter last night, but if we'd played on Friday night and drawn nil nil, and then Dunfermline had eh, Dunfermline had beaten Dundee United three one at three o'clock on Saturday, we'd have been cock a hoop. Like we'd just been absolutely <laughs> delighted with that. Coming, we we we'd be sitting here now having this conversation, absolutely over the moon, that we took a point and then Dundee United with all the pressure, then lost to the Vermont. Um, it just the, the timing kind of changes the conversation, but what it doesn't change is the reality of what the table looks like on you know Monday morning. Um, and that I just think that like there's there's decent teams in this division and you could no divine right to beat anybody I think we've seen that all the time and um, yeah I, I know what you mean about like the nil-nil that we played against Morton like I didn't think that was a bad nil-nil both uh, on a couple of levels so um, a, a boy I worked with years ago texted me this morning to say did I see you at that Rovers game yesterday and I was like well yeah I'm at the Rovers games all the time as far as I'm aware you're a Celtic supporter and I was it's not unusual to see me at the Rovers game. Um, <laughs> but he's like, he's like, oh, worst £20 I've ever spent. I was like, wow, if you think that's a bad nil-nil, like, I have news for you. That uh, <laughs> I thought that was pretty decent uh, over the piece. And also, just from a Rovers point of view, as a nil-nil, I thought it was, it was like, you know, some, a lot of the time, you watch a nil-nil or, or even just a side that hasn't scored, and you think, like, could have played all night and not <laughs> scored. And that nil nil against Morton felt like that for both sides. Actually, didn't feel like that to me yesterday. It felt like a Rovers goal almost felt inevitable, but only like it, the question was would would they get it before um, the final whistle went? Almost like if we just kept playing until somebody scored, I think the Rovers probably would have got it, and maybe only I don't know ten minutes after the ninety. Um, it did feel like that pressure was was building, um, but uh, Leslie, what about you uh, in terms of, I don't know, yeah, perspective and and kind of um, overall thoughts after that draw yesterday? So the, something I'd said as I was coming down the train in the morning before we saw the team lines before the game and anything was that win, lose or draw, it doesn't really change. Anything, which sounds a bit of a weird thing to say, but I think what I mean is because of the way the fixtures kind of work from now on in, it doesn't really change the fact that we need to go and get something at Tanadice and also that the pressure on Dundee United when we play them at Tanadice is going to be huge. So clearly a couple of extra points would have been really nice, but for me, as I say, it doesn't change the fact that we still need to go there and perform and that there is going to be a lot of pressure at Dundee United regardless of what they do when they play that game against Inverness before us. So for, for me, it's, uh, you know, I think it's, it's, a, it's a good point and you know, we'll, we'll come on and we'll talk about the game. I was quite, you know, telling, you know, we didn't go bonkers at the end to try and get the win. You know, we weren't sending the goalie up for corners. We weren't going three at the back. You know, if you think earlier in the season, Ian Murray was saying things like, I'd rather have three points and zero and I'd rather lose and trying to win. We didn't do that yesterday. And I think that was quite telling. You know, the, the kind of language that, that Murray was using in his interview, the way he tried to see the game out. Clearly, he was, he would have wanted the win, but he wasn't going to risk us losing to get it. So I think it was a, a very measured and controlled and, and sensible point that, as I say, doesn't change the fact that we have a very big game coming up for, for both sides at the end of this month. Yeah, I think that's, that's a really good point, actually, that probably the one thing that, 
like the, the big scenario you want to avoid is being sort of four or more point behind Dundee United going into that game at Tannadice. You don't want them having that kind of safety net of at least we'll still be top, whatever happens. So now it feels kind of like, obviously it's not, there's still games to come after that, but it feels like that's the biggest moment remaining in this title race almost is that game at Tannadice. And well, we've said it enough times, and I'm glad that since the first time we've said it, Jim Goodwin has really doubled down on sort of proving this theory that he, he can't perform under pressure. And there will not be any greater pressure in this kind of championship title race than that game at Tanadice. And at the point when it kicks off, the away end is going to be absolutely bouncing. Like every single person that away end, it's going to be like it finished the last time we were there. It's going to be full optimism, full back in the team, full voice, all that stuff. And the home end is going to be nervous and sort of on the verge of uproar. You know, like, it's obviously, it's not going to happen. But if they're overscored from kickoff in that game, Tanadice would be in revolt. Like, that they, because they've, they're, they've already basically written off Jim Goodwin. They are now just strapped in to see if he can get them promoted and then try and jettison him in the summer to get somebody better in. And, um, yeah, so that, that, yeah, I agree with what you're saying, that actually, because they'd lost almost whatever happened with Rovers, and obviously a win would have been um, excellent and, and would have been more welcome than a draw. But, uh, yeah, I was, I was the same. We got to the end of the game and I was, I was a long, long way from being um, annoyed or fed up or anything with. I think that there, are, there are alternative ways where that game goes and it finishes nil-nil. And you're annoyed and you're disappointed, but I just didn't see that with the way that the kind of the game developed or the way the Rovers approached the game. You know, um, we said before it, like on prior form this weekend, going to Hamden was a trickier assignment than going to East End Park. If you look at what the two teams had to do, um, and yeah, I don't think it draws a bad result against uh, sort of Callum Davidson's Queen's Park. They've been uh, they've been doing well, so um, yeah, I'm glad we're all kind of on the on the same page with that. Which like it is literally a missed opportunity, but it's not in the way that like bottle merchants, all this kind of stuff. That yeah. um, I think folk who haven't watched that game have been trying to pick that narrative mm -hmm. out, just looking at the the scoreline. I don't think it was reflected in the the actual pattern of the game. But I think you have um, to remember as well. I was just going to say, just really quickly, we have, we've got a free week next week and they've got Inverness at home. So they were almost certainly going to go into the game at Tanadice against us, top of the league. Like, I fully yeah. expect them to win that game next week. There's Actually, I wouldn't even say it's a pressure thing. Um, and, and I'm actually really glad that the... Because that's the one thing United have done relatively well this season, apart from the kind of there was the one spell where they they kind of had a wee sticky patch, but when they have had a setback, they've they've managed to kind of rectify it quite quickly. I'm glad they're going to rectify it against Big Dunk rather than you know their next game being against us. So I fully expect them to be top of the league when we go into that game, and I fully expect the pressure to be on them to stay there. Do you know what I mean? As we go into that Tanadice game. Um, yeah, I think you're. I think you're absolutely right. I think the home end's going to be really nervous. That's it. They, you know, it's not. It's a convenient narrative for us that they struggle with pressure, but there is a big enough body of evidence now that totally. Um, it's really like there is additional pressure for them to prove that they can cope under pressure. Yeah. Um, and yeah, certainly fortunate for us that we've got you know a bit of a break, um, time to get some uh, some bodies back as well. Um, the surprise in the uh, in the lineup yesterday, the the surprise that saves us, uh, the price of one t shirt. Um, <laughs> because uh, at fairness, I don't know if Robbie's actually sort of conducted a comprehensive check just to make sure nobody predicted that, nobody had any inside information. But certainly the um, the entries that I saw, nobody predicted James Brown dropping out and uh, Ross Matthews coming in at right back. But um, that was obviously that was the big um yeah the big surprise in the the team news taking that 
you know, one half of that. So taking the fact that James Brown was missing out, was there any alternative approach you maybe would have expected? Or um, I'm thinking in particular, like Scott McGill, for example, could have potentially come in at right back. Um, Scott, start with you. Any Were you surprised it was Ross Matthews? Did you see any prospect of a back three or, or anything else in there? I, I mean, with Ian Murray, there's always the potential of a back three. It's <laughs> potential of a back two. It's... <laughs> It can happen. So, I mean, uh, I, I wasn't too surprised that he went with Ross Matthews because, as we were saying yesterday, before the like once the team was out, that Matthews, when he was re- like sort of just as he broke through under McGlynn, McGlynn had played him out there uh, as like cover a few times and he played fine. But I'd actually been told, I was speaking to a guy who, who um, helps out the Rovers with some physio stuff this, this season. And he was saying that in some of the bounce games, they've played Ross Matthews at right back. So they've obviously been thinking about maybe we might need him at some point. And Matthews has probably said to Murray, he says, look, I can play there if needed. So it's good that we've got that sort of versatility in the squad. And obviously Scott Brown was still at centre-back again, um, even though Keith Watson was back. But uh, yeah, yet again, three what's that? Three clean sheets in a week. So... He's doing his, his bit back there, and he has done for, I think was it was Leslie said last week, he's been over 40% of the games. He's basically started at centre-half this season, so he almost is a centre-half this year, which is mental. But uh, And, I, I mean, overall, I think the rest of the team kind of was close to what folk thought in terms of midfield to front. Uh, it was just obviously that right-back uh, area that wasn't what everyone was thinking. I think the only thing I would say about the McGill situation is that he's not played really much football since when? October? November? Mm. So the fact he's not playing Dylan Core, I, I would be surprised if he then goes, oh, well, I've not played Scott McGill for three months. Let's just chuck him in. So I think it was the case that Ross Matthews has been playing. Let's just keep going. I mean, to be fair... Ross Matthews looked like a right back yesterday. He was pushing forward. He was like sending good long balls towards Rudden, and also just he just looked comfortable. Which I was a little bit surprised considering ah, he's not long back for injury. But how many years ago would it have been that he would have been in a competitive game at right back? So now fair play to him. I think it naturally just suits him though, doesn't it? Like McGill's a more I think when McGill first signed for us and they talked about, you know, Davy Hancock always does that, what what do you bring? What tell us about Scott McGill kind of thing. He he talked about being a ten, like that was his his preferred kind of position as more attacking. Whereas Ross Matthews is very much a box to box midfielder. And all you're really doing is shifting him fifteen, twenty yards to the right hand side and asking him to do the same job. He's de- more defensively minded, um he's more kind of aggressive, um, I think is important as well. Um, but I'd echo what Scott said. But he, he was brilliant yesterday. He was absolutely brilliant. Um, I absolutely loved that performance from Ross Matthews because it was everything that you want from Ross Matthews. Um, like I say, hard work, endeavour, dig. Um, yeah, he was. He, I thought he was brilliant. Yeah, I, I thought so too. Because I mean, we were in the car. Um, I, so I was driving. My dad had the lineup, and he's like. There's no no James Brown. Like oh Christ, okay. And he's looking at like the BBC lineup and he's like, they've got Turner at right back. And we're both like, well, the one thing we can guarantee is it's not gonna be Kyle Turner at right back. So then you're just looking at the rest of the team, like, who who will this be? And it's that as as you say, Scott, there's the the um ever present spectre of is Ian Murray just gonna do something ludicrous? Be like, if it's a back four, who's gonna play right back? And it's it's exactly that. Ross Matthews think, okay going to have to play someone out of position put them in at a full back what do you want well, you want you know like um the ability to pass the ability to tackle a bit of drive more than anything else like disciplined which i think is what you get from ross matthews like he absolutely sticks to his role almost yep. regardless of, of what it is um and i i was yeah i was quite happy with that um you know, it's a thing you see sometimes. You see managers, um, I think Doug Emery actually did this yesterday with um, Tyler French, who they'd been playing at right back and had been, you know, kind of stinking out the joint. So he decided to move him into defensive midfield. 
um, you do see that sometimes, like kind of moving the fullback into the middle. It's probably rarer to see you moving a defensive midfielder out to a fullback. But I was so much happier with um, Ross Matthews doing that rather than what I think a lot of managers would do, which is you know moving a centre half out wide. Like I've mentioned that a number of times, McGlynn kept doing it with Dave McKay. Yeah, and it's like what you get in defensive solidity, you lose so much more when you've actually got the ball, and that's what I was really impressed with with, with Ross Matthews. I just wonder, if, sorry, times... just to jump in quickly. I wonder if Josh Mullen would have been a debate yeah. if he was fit. My it's problem would have been that the last time he did that was when we were at home at Queens Park and missing a right back. So yeah, I'm kind of glad he went with Matthews, but I think that was taken. The decision was obviously taken out his hand that Mullen wasn't fit enough. So it might have been a different question if he had been fit. Uh, I'm still saying that if this comes up again in the last seven games of the season, you're going with Ross Matthews ahead of Josh Mullen because yeah, Josh Mullen gives right. you so much more going forward. And he, he showed in a couple of games this season, he, he really struggles to watch when like players are rotating around him who he's meant to be picking up. So I think you've got to go with the sort of def- more defensive option in Matthews. Matthews, oh, it just gives you a better yeah. balance. Um, yeah. In there, and I'd say it was the you. You know what you're getting with Ross Matthews is if you ask him to defend, he will defend, and he'll do it well. And he said the bit that impressed me was the few times that he actually sort of stepped out as well. And um, I think kind of naturally because of you know where he's used to playing, he kind of drifted inside a couple of times rather than kind of overlapping round Aidan Connolly. He was coming inside, but that's a perfectly good option, and, and you could see the defense, um, the Queens Park defense struggling with that a little bit. Um, but yeah, Leslie, you, as Scott says, you've been kind of keeping an eye on <laughs> the, the various uh, permutations in this defence. So um, two midfielders in the defence yesterday, but it's a, another clean sheet. Just give me your thoughts on the um, that whole situation, please. So I've been looking at the numbers. And again, this is not a precise science. and I might have missed things because I was just looking at it during a coffee break. I make it now, I think that's 14 games this season of the 29 or whatever we've played, that Scott Brown has started as a centre-back. So we're almost half the games we've started with a midfielder who two years ago was playing part-time football in the leagues below as a centre-back. It's always worth keeping that in mind. I do not mean any disrespect to Scott Brown when I say that. You know, we're up against Dundee United who've got a full international at the heart of their defence. You know, so it's worth just keeping that in perspective. I think fans of other teams scoffing, oh, use a bottle that use a shot in the bed, would do very well to bear that in mind, that you know, we had two midfielders starting in defence yesterday. And I think, you know, just, just to carry on my venting, I think something else that's worth bearing in mind is we had, that was three starting members that were missing yesterday. So no Watson, no James Brown, also no Josh Mullen. You're taking three starting players out. What that means then is you're taking Ross Matthews and Scott Brown out in the midfield, which is limiting what you can do further forward. You know, you're then asking Aidan Connolly to put a shift in, who, bear in mind, has not had a pre-season and is, you know, was missing at the start of the season. So you know, it's, it, you're missing three starting members, but because of the nature of who you're missing, it's really limiting what you can do to further up the pitch. So and that, that's one of the big reasons why I really would hesitate to say yesterday was a, a missed opportunity, given the, the kind of constraints that we had. I mean, the thing I did find, I, what, what really kind of fried my brain, so I got the team line, so I stepped off the train at Mount Florida, and you're, you're looking, you're thinking, okay, there's no there's no James Brown. The logical thing there is Ross Matthews goes into the right back. But then you're looking at the bench, you're seeing Sean Byrne on the bench. And so you're thinking, right, well, who's playing sort of at the base of the midfield? And you're kind of thinking, what's going to happen in there? You know, so presumably one of Turner, and it turned out it was going to be Turner playing a bit deeper, Turner, Stanton, possibly Vaughan. You're, you're trying to figure out what happened. So that one, that was the that was a bit that surprised me was if Matthews comes out the base of the midfield and Brown's at centre back, who's doing the sort of deeper role in, in, in the midfield? And that's what I, I I couldn't figure out until we actually kicked off. I don't know if if Sean Burns maybe still just got a little bit of a I an wondered. issue. I I did wonder I think that. He must do. Yeah, because that certainly it would seem like. For exactly what you've said there, it would be a more natural fit. Mm-hmm. Um, and well, I, I don't think it was like a, a critical issue or um, something that was you know crying out to be resolved or anything. I did think the first half, Kyle Turner was kind of facing his facing his own goal a little bit too often. He was kind of 
chasing back and having to do a lot of stuff that I, I suspect Kyle Turner's not it's not the top of his list for what he wants to be doing. Um you, you would you would suspect if um Sean Byrne was kind of fully fit and firing, he might have come in there. Um I mean to be fair, Kyle Turner yeah. played well on Tuesday night and got his assist as well. And I see, I don't think he played badly yesterday. Yeah. But yeah, no. maybe he just would have given a, a bit of um slightly better balance. We had um, the we had the same debate on the bus. I was going to say the the back four versus the back three thing, and it was the rest of the lineup that kind of made me feel quite confident he was going with that back four. Um, if he'd gone back three, I would have expected to see Smith in there because um, he's done that kind of role for him before. And um, obviously, in the absence of Mullen, um, who's another kind of stalwart that he's used in that kind of midfield role. But um, if you're playing a back three, you're definitely not playing Aidan Connolly and um, Dylan Easton as your two wide men. Maybe Connolly. I, I didn't see you relying on Easton to cover the left-hand side of your pitch. Um, as as good as he can be, I don't think that's his um, that's his role. I thought Turner was actually really good um, yesterday. I, I agree, Duncan, it was a very different kind of role for him. It was far more um, deep, but there was and, and I say shades of, but there was shades of Regan Henry in there yesterday for me. Just the way that he controlled the game and the way that he kind of pulled the strings a little bit um, his distribution is is brilliant. His set piece deliveries are phenomenal. Like the fact that we've got him in, you know, Mullins injured and is missing, who's arguably your best set piece taker, and then you've got Turner who's just come in and picked up the mantle. Do you know what I mean it's um, uh, really positive? Yeah, and, no, uh, I was thinking that too. I, I mean, it's just every week we're seeing more and more of the Kyle Turner we thought we were getting. You know. And I mean, yeah. you're, you're watching, especially in the second half, you could just see his tail was up, you know. He'll get the ball in the middle. And I think the, the Regan Henry comparison's a really good one because you'd expect if that's Sean Burney's going to make a sideways pass and it's going to find another player and it's all going to be fine. Yeah. Turner, you think he's going to pass, then he'll take it round the boy and he'll go on a wee run with it and he'll drive it forward. And it was you, know, you can just see the confidence start to come back and we're starting, yeah. it's just the right time for him to be get, coming into a rich vein of form. It bodes well. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, you mentioned this set piece ability there. Set pieces were kind of the the story of the first half, or um, certainly the, the opening uh, kind of exchanges. It was a kind of a, it, was a, it was a half of two halves. I thought that yeah, um, it was. first forty five <laughs> yesterday. The the kind of first twenty five minutes maybe um, mm-hmm. the Rovers were on top. It was, there were a lot of corners um, in that time. And then, yeah, maybe the the second sort of the the twenty minutes up till half time, Queens might be a little bit more on top, but no, I don't think either goalkeeper really had had kind of too much to do. Um, any particular thoughts on the on the first half? What about um, actually, Blair? Give me your thoughts on Zach Rudden and kind of the role that he played in that first half. Yeah, I'm. I feel bad. I I I've been quite vocal about how much I've enjoyed him since he's come. I did not enjoy Zach Rudden yesterday. Um, his first half performance for me was pretty much the problem that we had in that first half. Nothing stuck. Nothing that went forward stayed there long enough for anybody in the midfield. Because Turner was playing that kind of deeper role, the ball was almost bypassing Stanton. But because Turner, eh, sorry, because Rudden wasn't able to kind of hold the ball up or or kind of feed anybody in, it was then bypassing Stanton on the way back. So for the first 25 minutes or so, we looked good. But then in that sort of second 20 minutes, um, I don't think Stanton touched the ball pretty much in that 20 minutes because it just seemed to pass him by in both directions. Um, I made the joke at half time, but Rudden reminded me like a, you know, when you see like a newborn baby giraffe that doesn't quite know how his legs works. It was just, it was all limbs. It was everywhere. The ball wasn't sticking to him. Um, he couldn't get it under control. He couldn't get any kind of foothold on the game, which was um, disappointing. I mean, he's obviously, Murray had said he'd been ill um, through the week. So it's maybe just part of that. I don't know, I'm making excuses for the guy, but it wasn't a, it wasn't a good first half performance. And I have to say, alongside him, I don't think Dylan Easton had a particularly great day yesterday either. Um, looked good. I thought in spells, Easton, um, but was really guilty of losing the ball. Um, he did it. There was one point I thought it was really interesting. Actually, he lost the ball about three times in the space of about two or three minutes. Um, and Easton's obviously a really popular player in that dressing room. And um, it was Turner that went for him. 
Turner's standing about five yards from him, like pointing at him and going three, three times, three times you've done that, cut it out. Um, which I love. I, I love that accountability thing that we've got going on. Um, but yeah, running for me yesterday, nah, nah, didn't happen. The thing with Easton yesterday is he seemed to be, and anyway, this must be incredibly frustrating as as the player himself, as much as anything. Like his movement was really good, and he was getting yeah. into the right areas. And there's a couple of times he actually sort of beat his man, and it was just that little, like the final ball where he just can't quite wrap his foot around it. And there's one that's it's on the highlights um, where he's he's kind of on the touchline and he's he's got his quick feet and he kind of steps around two players and does it really well. And then as he goes to just play like the five yard pass, he kind of trips the ball just a yeah. couple of yards away from himself. And it's that kind of thing where. Um, it's going so well, but if the final ball's not there, it doesn't really count for, for anything. No. Um, I think that the big thing with Dylan Easton is that he keeps going. Yeah. A lot of wingers at this level, you see they start off like that and you can tell what kind of game they're going to have based on their first five minutes. Mm-hmm. Whereas Easton does at least have that ability to to keep going. And that might mean that he loses the ball three times in the bounce. Yeah. But at least he's I would say the same for Rudden, three though. things. I would say exactly the same for Rudden. It's funny, we had this same conversation obviously second half when he when he substituted the two of them at the same time and took them both off. Um I was I was talking about it. the 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 one attribute I would put to them, the player that epitomized it most for me was Grant Anderson. So Grant Anderson was a player for the Rovers who a lot of people thought was mints. And uh, he was he was good and he did his job but he was he was quite limited. But he used to get quite a lot of stick week in, week out. And it was because he never had he was always involved and he was always a part of it. So he would always make a mistake and he would always lose the ball. It was just part and parcel of having Grant Anderson in your team. And it's that thing. Rudden was the same yesterday. He never stopped. It wasn't going well. Easton never stopped. It wasn't going well. But I like that about this team. There, there is no, and again, a player I quite enjoy, but there's no Joe Cardell. You know what I mean, there's nobody hiding away in the touchline thinking, nah, no for me today. I think the thing with Rudden is if I, if I sort of picture his his average kind of interaction yesterday is his average um, <laughs> piece of play, it's probably with his back to goal, maybe 50 yards off the, the byline, <laughs> slightly to the side of the, the centre circle, yeah. just kind of trying to bring the ball in and trying to release it to somebody. And I see a couple of things it. that didn't happen, exactly. <laughs> but even when he does... It's a case of bring it down, turn, move. He's still 45 yards away from goal. And there yeah. is one chance where he does that and he does manage to get turned and he gets going. And you can see actually very briefly he looks up and he thinks, I've not had a shot all game. I could have one here. And he's still he 40 yards away. And he's <laughs> yeah, like, you ah, totally right, see okay. it. <laughs> and he, he slips a, a good pass in. But um, you can definitely see that's the first thing in his mind. But I, I like that in a striker. But it's very... Um, it's not the game any striker wants to have. And it's a game I think you see a lot of strikers have at this level. And in in particular, the last couple of seasons, we've talked about it a lot. You're playing guys like Ethan Varian up front or um, Jamie Gullen as well sometimes, where you think you're you're effectively playing a focal point striker. Vaughn's there as well, but you're playing like a big guy up front. And has he had any shots? Like... And that's not the be all and end all, but um, when Zach Rudden's been at his best, he's been doing all that movement and he's been kind of getting chances as well. And that just never really um, yeah. kind of came off for him. Um, Scott, anything you want to add on the, the first half in general? Uh, not, not too much. I mean, I think we looked comfortable for most of the half. Uh, I mean, Queen's Park from what I could see from my, the stream that I, I had and then also in the highlights was like, they had a few sort of half chances and shots but like Kev didn't really look too troubled in anything and then, I mean, I think uh, somebody put in the group chat yesterday, we'd had about seven corners in like 25 minutes and it was just like, surely we're going to get a chance for one of them here <laughs> with a mind, just by the low averages but uh Again, we didn't really create too much uh, in terms of other than just a few half chances. So, no, I thought I thought it just kind of the whole game. To be honest, was a bit like that. It was just 
other than obviously we'll talk about the chance that Carl Ferry made a really good save in the second half, but the whole chant the whole game was just for half chances, really. It wasn't like, oh, that's an absolute sitter or he has to score that. There wasn't a lot of that yesterday, but at the same time, it was by far better than nil nil at Holt and Green at Morton. So, uh, no, the first half, I just thought we looked comfortable, to be honest. Yeah, uh, that's uh, we, we never looked in danger in that first half, but probably never kind of created enough either. Second half was a little bit more open. Um, the highlights for the second half kind of start with two. Two kind of refereeing incidents, I suppose you would call them. Um, Leslie, the first one, Rudden's fouled on the edge, or sort of in and around the edge of the box. Sorry, no, that's not true. Rudden fouls officially, yeah. if yeah. you go by the uh, the record of the game. Now, I thought at the time, I thought he'd book, sorry, I thought he'd given the the free kick for diving. Actually, I thought he'd, he'd kind of penalised Rudden for going down too easily. But it does look like actually he gives the foul. Give me your your thoughts on that. Um, kind of incident, please. It was I was I was like you. I was I was really confused. I, I couldn't quite work out what was going on from from the stand because it looks like you know Robin fouls the boy, the boy fouls him. And um, I actually thought for a split second I thought we'd got a penalty. Um, and I was kind of like out my seat like hey penalty. Um, it turned out it wasn't quite wasn't quite the case. Um, you know as you say I think it, I, I thought it was a, a, a foul given for for diving. It, it, it turned out that wasn't the case, and you know, and then we also had um, what again from the stand looked like another penalty shout a bit later. But again, it was one of those ones where, and it's a cliche, but it's true, the players were not protesting as much as the fans, and I think that's mm. often the, the the giveaway in in these situations when you don't get as much protestation from the guys on the pitch as you do from the from the from the folk in the stands. So yeah, it could it could have gone either way, but I wasn't as as aggrieved as I, as I might have been in another day. Uh, Blake, give me your thoughts on that Rudden one. Um, I don't know if you've seen the highlights back to a, a second look at it. Yeah, um, I thought it was a penalty. I'm not going to lie. I, th- I think the, um, there is, the, they're, they're jostling each other, they're wrestling each other, but the contact that he, um, that Rudden makes on the defender does not make the defender fall in the direction that he falls. So if, if it genuinely is a foul, he'd have fallen the other way for me. Um, I don't think he has enough contact on him. And then the boy kind of wipes him out. I do think Rudden goes down like he's diving, which probably doesn't help. The the you know you sometimes see that like a player who is actually fouled but somehow makes it look like he hasn't been. I think the way he went down was quite theatrical, so it probably went against him a little bit. Um, but um, I thought giving the foul the other way was was ludicrous for me. To be fair, I thought if he's I said at the time if it's not a penalty, play on because there's no way Rudden's fouled him. No, I see. I, I, I honestly just did not occur to me that it was a no. foul. As I thought he'd booked him for, or I say he didn't book him, which was led yeah. to my further confusion. Um, not a unique situation. Um, <laughs> and I looking at it back, I think it looks like a penalty to me as well. Um, there's not like there's not a huge amount of contact, but it runs no. kind of both his feet are off the ground, so it doesn't take a huge amount of contact. And as you see, yeah. he does kind of. Collapse to the floor, but I think he's just a big <laughs> laddie. That like just that's what yeah. happens. I think it was the um, baby giraffe thing, wasn't it? Lives yeah. everywhere. <laughs> and then the one after that, Aidan Connolly has a shot, kind of into kind of two bodies, and um, I'm I'm going to say Ian Grieve has put the highlights together. I assume. I apologies if it was someone else on the editing duties. Gives us a good two or three replays of that. I don't know what I'm supposed to be looking at with that. Um, Scott, are you? Are you seeing a, a handball in there? I mean, Aidan Connolly did. Aidan Connolly's going tonto, but um, how about you? Uh, well, to be fair, I was screaming for Connolly to just hit it first time before taking that touch, uh, <laughs> before he set himself for it. But uh, I, I think what we're supposed to be looking at is the once the defender's blocked it, it's then hit off the other defender in front of him. And it's hit him like up near his shoulder. In the arm. But like, I'm yeah, sorry, yeah. the guy has no time to react and it's literally None. stuck to his, his side. So like, it's different <laughs> if his arm's like miles out of his body, then right, you've got a, an argument. But and the fact that he went like mental, I was like, right, calm down a wee bit. It's no, it's no an absolute sitter here that he's missed. But it's not. I, I didn't think it was a penalty and if a penalty was given against us or something like that, I'd be going off my head. 
that, that that's a penalty. So, no, even I think even if, well, we might get it to the next season, but if VAR was involved in that, I'm pretty certain that would have just been waved off straight away because, like, what you're meant to do, a ball just deflects your way a yard from the defender that's next to you and your arms right next to your body. There's nothing else you can do. So, no, nah, it wasn't a penalty for me. Yeah, that, that was that was kind of how I saw it as well. Is his arms are down by his side. It does come up. It hits him, but it hits him in the sleeve. It's not a... I, I think it would be a very, very soft penalty, that one. Um, <clears throat> kind of after that point, the, the chances really start kind of coming in. And there are... There's enough chances to win a game of football in this. Um, and this, I think, is why I, I wasn't kind of disgruntled or anything by the end of the game. As I said earlier already, um, already, it felt like a goal was coming. It just maybe was going to take, you know, 40 or 50 minutes and there was only 15 minutes left. Um, the first chance is, is one of these ones where if you were to describe it to someone, it just feels inevitably like it must be a goal. So Lewis Vaughn nutmegs the goalkeeper inside the six-yard box and somehow the ball ends up going away from the goal, which, I mean, and it's not a, like, there's no criticism of Vaughn there. It's not like he's he's wasted the chance or anything. I mean, it, he actually does really well to create the chance. He's in a really kind of tight space and brings it around, does everything right. I think in what will be a recurring theme over the next couple of minutes, I think you've just got to credit the goalkeeper. He makes himself big, he, he gets something on it, and it's enough to, to bring it away from the goal. Um, and then I think the next thing after that is really Kevin Dubrovsky's one big involvement, probably, in, in the entire game. Um, again, it's a decent save. It's it's kind of similar to the ones we've talked about with him recently, where it's quite close to him, but he's in no kind of doubt about what he wants to do with it. He wants to just get that clear. Um, I mean, in terms of that chance and, and really any other... Was there any point you felt like a a Queen's Park goal was kind of on the cards in that second half, um, Les? I mean, I thought it could have been coming. I do think Queen's Park were a lot less dangerous when first Sheridan and thereafter Thomas came off. I think, you know, we we, we talked about it on the pre-match pod, you know, Sheridan had kind of been this uh, sort of almost banter figure after his spell at Inverness, but he was really good, I thought, for Queen's Park yesterday. You know, he's a big he's a big unit and he was causing us a lot of a, a lot of bother. Um I think it might have been Peyton. Somebody had a very powerful header that that went past the post at, which I actually didn't see it come in because I glanced down at my phone to check the scores and I looked up and saw the ball zipping past the post. I was like, Jesus Christ, that could have been a, that could have been dangerous. You know, they they had a couple of moments, but yeah, I think I think they, they came they came in a kind of flurry. They had a they had a spell of corners as well. Kev had a good save. Sheridan, you're only going to get 60 minutes out of him, given you know his his age and his injury history. You're not going to get more than an hour out of him. Thomas being taken off, I, I thought that was a strange one again, just given his quality and experience. And you know, and again, as we've seen in the past with Queens Park, although they're a vastly improved side to what we saw with Eldman, they still have a lot of very young players, and yeah, and then you are bringing a lot of very kind of young and experienced guys on when you're taking some of these older guys off. So yeah, I think they had a, a couple of chances, but they, they certainly weren't battering us. I think you know, there was at the end of the first half we were pinned in for quite a while and there was, it looked like there was a conscious decision to sit a bit deeper and, and just kind of weather the storm. But you know, they, they, they had a few chances but they certainly weren't battering us and they definitely became less dangerous as, as the second half wore on. Yeah, I, I, I was surprised you want to took... Where do you go, boy? I was going to say, I think if you want to not that I'm advocating that opposition managers should listen to us mumbling on a lot of <laughs> nonsense, but if you want a blueprint for how to play against us, Kelly and Sheridan gave you it yesterday. Yeah. Be big, be tall, go against Scott Brown. Like, with the best will in the world, Kelly and Sheridan won every single header that he had to win yesterday. He got abso- Brown got absolutely no change out of him whatsoever. But at the same time, they never created anything of, of significant note. Um, but it was a it was a really good save um, from Big Kev. Um, again, we've, we've we've spoken about it, and you mentioned it's really close to him, um, and through a sea of bodies as well. So, um, Aye, credit to you, that was really good. Aye. I, I was I was surprised he took Dom Thomas off, not because he was playing well. I actually, thought that's the poorest I've seen him playing uh, in a while. Mm. But just that he is—he's the kind of guy who 
only needs one chance, you know, can get something out of nothing, a decent shot on him from range. And uh, yeah, I think I think you're right, Les. That Queen's Park squad is still in that place where they've managed to bring a couple of decent players in. They've improved their starting 11, but they're, like, fundamentally they're still bringing on inexperienced guys, haven't played a lot of football, certainly not at this level. Um, and I think that did contribute a fair bit to the the kind of pattern of the the last 15 minutes where, and particularly watching it back in the highlights, the Rovers really are kind of knocking on the door in that that later period. Um, I mean, the the Scott McGill chance, the first one, the the it's even better goalkeeping than I thought it was at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, just... I, um, in the first angle the, the, from the highlights, it looks like Stanton should only have to stretch and put it in. It's only seeing it from the the kind of the GoPro angle from behind. He's, he's never, you know, close enough to it. He's, he's never got any chance. But there's um, there's the... So there's that one where McGill kind of puts it across the goal and uh, Ferry kind of gets a hand out to it. Stanton then has the sort of audacious kind of lob-type effort. The keeper saves as well. There's then... Um, Callum Smith has a fairly decent chance where he gets the ball out from under his feet, but maybe not enough power in the shot. Scott McGill has a similar one, which goes just wide of the post. Callum Smith then has the one that he snatches at, um, where the ball's been kind of bobbling around. I mean, <laughs> listing out those chances like that, is it a case of maybe kind of starting to talk about, you know, you should be doing better? Or do sometimes do you just come up against a goalkeeper on his day and you've kind of got to put your hands up to that? Um, uh, Blair, uh, give me your thoughts just on any of those chances and anything you want to pick out from that. Yeah, I was going to say yesterday was just like, it was the universe for me. Um, you know, what Mehmet giveth, fairy taketh away. Um, he was brilliant. He, he, and you have to, sometimes you just have to hold your hands up and say like, we, we created good opportunities we tested the goalie and he was he was you know up to it um the one from mcgill i mean we were where we were in the stand we were basically along the six yard line i was celebrating because i thought the way the ball was spinning i thought it was going to nestle in the bottom corner and as the ball went past the post i was absolutely gutted um it's just one of those i think like you know you could look at that and go it's a shame that fell to mcgill which is harsh, but, you know, if it had fallen to Vaughan, what would have happened? If it had fallen east, and what would have happened? That kind of thing. But I don't think McGill does anything wrong. I think it's a really good effort. He gets it on target. He, he gets the ball down. Um, the Stanton effort is ridiculous. Um, the save is ridiculous. Um, yeah, I think it's just it's just one of those. Fair play to, to, to Ferry. He's, he's clearly a very good goalkeeper. Um, and we just, we just couldn't beat him. When you look at the three, the three kind of big saves. So there's one where um, he gets out really quick to Vaughn, and it all goes through his legs. He gets it away from the goal. There's mm-hmm. then the close range one where it's basically a reaction save um, from McGill, and then a, a really kind of acrobatic save from Stanton. It's like three different kind of yeah. pieces of um, goalkeeping, three different skills from a from a goalkeeper. Um, Leslie, do you think there's many other goalkeepers in the division that, that kind of are able to do all of that? Kevin Dubrovsky. <laughs> Other than that, probably not. Um, no, I think I think he had a... It, Ferry had an, an absolutely magnificent game yesterday. And again, it's like when you're, you're playing the computer game and you look at the player and there's the wee red up arrow, you know, that means they're just on absolutely magnificent form and you know that you're you're not ever going to beat them. I mean, the, the only thing I could say if I was picking it here is a wee bit from our side is, and it goes back to what I said at the, at the top of the, the show, that... With the, the starting members that we had missing and with the fact that we'd had to move players around, the tiger cage maybe wasn't as strong yesterday as it as it might otherwise have been. So, you know, in another week you might have been able to bring Aidan Connolly off the bench, and then you're talking about Aidan Connolly getting those chances with fresh legs rather than Scott McGill. You know, you might then have Louis Vaughan playing a wee bit further forward for the whole game and maybe being in a slightly better position for some of the earlier chances. That's picking it hairs, though, and that's not in any way a criticism of those players. And I, it was in, it was a few weeks ago, and Jim Clark had said this in the commentary at Wraith TV. The other team are allowed to play well. You know, if if we don't win, it's not always our fault. And you do just have to say it was a, a magnificent 
goalkeeping performance. I've said it before, the standard of goalkeeping in the Championship is, is very good. And then Callum Ferry is, is, is up there with, uh, with, uh, with the best of them. That's it. I mean, we'll, we'll talk about our kind of Rovers man in the match in a second, but I don't think there's any denying if you were if you were picking a, a neutral, you know, a man in the match across both sides, it's Callum Ferry for me by a by a fair distance. I don't think anybody else stood out more than uh, more than he did. Um, Scott, anything you want to add on on any of that kind of final period, any of those chances um, up towards the end of the game? Yeah, I mean, just kind of what Blair was touching on with the Stanton effort, it was just ridiculous. I mean, at that point, my stream was kind of playing up. It was kind of jumping and stuff like that. So I only saw it clearer on the highlights. And just, you almost, I almost didn't understand how Ferry reacted so quickly to it because it was so, it, it, it's different if it was like a looping overhead kick for the edge of the box or something that, that he's just like backtracked and got to it. But this one, he's actually had to just fling himself at it and just hope that he can get fingertips on to, to tip it round the post. And somehow he's managed to uh, to get back and do it. So fair play to him. But Stanton must, as soon as he's hit it, he's probably kind of glanced back and just thought, oh, that's going in. And then just as it's not, he must have been just devastated. Uh, but I, I know it was, I mean, I think one thing is, I don't know, I can't remember if Money maybe mentioned it in his interview, but it's more of a thing, for, especially for strikers, it's it's more frustrating if we're not creating these chances than if you're getting the chances but not taking them. Whereas we created plenty yesterday. Yeah, it didn't go in, but at the same time, yeah. I think if you told us that it was going to be seven points in a week, however that happened, the seven points, I think it, folk would have actually... Again, it's that perspective of see if we'd got a draw midweek and won that yesterday, the sort of the feel around the result would have been a hell of a lot different because then it's like, oh we've won when Dundee United didn't win, but at the same time it doesn't matter if you got the point midweek or got it yesterday. It's it's the same points at the end of the day. So I think yeah, seven points out of nine in a week in the championships a pretty good return. Uh, considering the amount of games we've kind of played in the last couple of weeks as well. So, no, I was kind of happy with everything. And, uh, yeah, it's different if we're not making the chances. That's it. And it's, it's creating chances at one end and keeping them out at the other end. Um, you know, three clean sheets on the bounce. I don't know that I necessarily thought this Rovers team had that in them, mm-hmm. if I'm honest. Especially um, after our growth. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. And especially, uh, especially with another midfielder at right back. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's that's a, that's a good point. Maybe if if um, you know if you'd said to me six weeks ago, other oh, overs are going to go three clean sheets in the bounce, I'd be saying, ah, I see what happens when you get Watson and Murray playing together, and, and yeah. finally you get a settled back four. But that's not been the case. But they've they've really um, done very very well to adapt to that. Um, in terms of a um, man of the match, um, so for me it would be Ross Matthews. Uh, I think just you've got the obviously the the circumstance of having to step into a situation that, that he's you know typically unfamiliar with, um, although has played there before. And as as we said earlier, I just thought the way that he um, kind of stepped up to the plate and didn't just do the basics. You know, you see that sometimes, you especially asking a player to go into defence. You know, they'll do their defending, but they won't. They're almost afraid to do any more than that for a risk of leaving the door open. I thought he did much more than just his defending. He was stepping out and in a way that sometimes our, our actual fullbacks haven't always done this season. So they thought very well did very well with that. Um Scott, anyone else you want to kind of put forward for, for Man the Match? Uh nah, to be honest, I had uh, Ross Matthews and and my thoughts for it, to be honest. It was other than as you say, if you if you were just a neutral, it probably would have been Callum Ferry because of the especially the second half, the saves he was making to keep... To, he basically got Queen's part that point yesterday after the second half performance. So I think uh, yeah, it would probably have to be Ross Matthews. I mean, if you were to pick out anybody else, you could possibly say one of the other defenders, if anything, just the fact there was another clean sheet. But I don't think you could have given it to anybody in the attacking sort of sense. There wasn't really any standouts up front at all. <laughs> That's fair. 
Um, Leslie, anyone for you? Anyone you want to shine a light on? I'd just be another another vote for Ross Matthews. I mean, also just just picking up what Scott said. I thought you and Murray did well as well. Although there was a couple yeah. of points in the first half as well. Louis Vaughan made an uncharacteristically sloppy back pass. It ended up, you know, could have been very very dangerous for us. You and Murray just mopped it up. He also again took one to use the the John Hughes parlance in the dish and uh, required a bit of treatment for it. But you know, it, it took the stopped the ball, took the, the sting out of the, the the Queen's Park attack. So I thought you and Murray again. In the absence of Keith Watson, he's really stepped up to the plate as, as a leader. Um, Nick, no game next weekend would be a really nice time to give us a new bit of news, like, for example, a Ross Matthews contract extension. So if anybody <laughs> from the club is or the management is listening, get on to it. Uh, Blair, full house, you got Matthews as well? Yeah, 100%. Um, I would also just honourable mentions that the, the rest of the back four, actually. I thought Brown um, and Dick, um, very good. And Kyle Turner for me um, again. Um, I agree with Scott though. Everybody beyond that, it was pass marks, but but nothing nothing stand out. Um, but no, really really impressed with Ross Matthews. Uh, Ross Matthews at right back, really impressed. That's it. I think it's over the piece you're talking about, kind of six and sevens out of ten, which is what you'd yeah. expect from a nil nil. But um, whilst we did not play brilliantly. But by any stretch of the imagination, I also didn't think anybody played badly at all, which is not always the case with these nil nils. You know, we played Martin, there were deficiencies in there. I think, see, I think that one, like, you, you've got to give the opposition credit sometimes. Not yeah. an easy place to go, fundamentally. Um, a good point, and I think if if either side was going to win that, I thought we looked more likely the, the longer the game went on, but kind of ran out of time. You can't um, forget as well, they've they've scored 10 in their last four, albeit six of them were against our growth and our growth were at fault for about five of them. But, you know, they were, a, they were a team that came into that game in pretty good goal-scoring form. Like, the fact that we went there with two midfielders at, at the back and, and got a clean sheet in any game in the Championship is good. But, um, yeah, I think that's that's worth bearing in mind as well. In our last 100%. two games as then, well, we've came up against the two top arguably the two top strikers in the league and none of them have scored. So yep. fair play to, again, Scott Brown filling in and you and Murray taking one in the dish yet again. Uh, it's a much more kind of mature, mature is maybe not the right word, but um, you know, in the way that in the first half of the season there was, we've not said, we've not said the word Murray ball for weeks. No. Um, <laughs> And that does not necessarily to say that this is a better way of doing it than than otherwise. Far more you composed, know, though, isn't it? Exactly. You know, th- there is a chance that with the kind of chaos factor of the first half of the season, we might have won that three two. Easily could have lost it three two as well. Nil nil, but with a lot of good chances towards the end of the game to win that. Like I'm, I'm quite happy yeah. with that. Right. And I was going to um, say just really quickly, when Murray went there, I forgot about it until Les mentioned taking one in the <laughs> coupon when he was down injured. One of the boys next to me was like, "Oh no, nah, Murray's injured. That's it." Like, no, our, our staff was like, it's all right, it's just his head. It's just his head. <laughs> like, it's not his groin. It's not his, it's not his shoulder. It's just his face. We'll, we'll be fine. It's just the face. Well, it's like his, his skull was a quarter of an inch thicker than anybody else's. <laughs> you and Murray syndrome. <laughs> oh, why me? Um, <laughs> so just, just a final point on this game. Then we, we, did, we talked about this at the beginning, so we don't need to kind of labour this point. But... Um, when the full time whistle does go, and uh, yeah, nil nil, creditable performance as we've said, there was a a smattering of uh, of booze. I think is probably the official parlance for that. Now, worth pointing out that I mean, in terms of a, a vocal minority, that's kind of booing is literally that. It's much easier to make yourself heard, and it was only you know uh, probably a handful yeah. of people in that stand compared to the the hundreds that were were quite happily kind of applauding the players' efforts. But I mean, come on. Like <laughs> I'm kinda holding back a little bit because just but I mean, I don't we've talked before at other points this season about like the sense of entitlement and all this kind of stuff. And like I said it maybe ten minutes ago. You people who just saw the the score line, you know, like Dundee United fans who, you know, fair play didn't watch the game, you wouldn't expect them to. They see the scoreline, they're like, oh, nil, nil, you know, they've bottled it, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, it's not like we haven't been saying that all season about them, based mostly just on their score lines. The folk in the ground have just watched the 90 <laughs> minutes as it unfolded. 
And like I heard a guy after the game and he's like, Oh, shut the bed as usual. It's like <laughs> have you just been have you been reading a book for the last ninety minutes? <laughs> like that's like that. No, he definitely the- has it. There's many things that <laughs> that individual might have been doing. Reading is not one of them. <laughs> but like after they are both game, that's a yeah. legitimate opinion. Yep. Um you know, that that's absolutely you could point that finger and, and be justified. <laughs> But not that's not just not how that game unfolded. It's just no. not like it's not a representation it would have been a of lot had we played rubbish yesterday and then folk went, <laughs> Oh, it was nil nil and we never looked like doing anything. That's different. <laughs> but when you've created that's chances it. and came up against a good goalie and I just wasn't your day in front of goal, there's not much else you could have done really. It's as you say, it is the sense of entitlement, and some folk really just need to have a, a look at themselves sometimes because it's it's the Rovers are never going to be. It's almost like they're treating us like we're Celtic or Rangers going to win every game, and you're just like, hold on a second, we've got we're up against a team arguably that think that they should have been winning this league by twenty points, going by their fans, and the fact that they've got a striker that's on about four or five grand a week. Which is about four players for us. Like, I mean, folk really need to give themselves a shake at times. It is quite pathetic how it's so not. It's like so. Ian Murray goes on about it as well with the squad. It's like some folk just get so high and just stay up there until we get beaten. Yeah. Then it's like, oh, it's the end of the world. And you're just like, well, there's got to be some sort of perspective at some point here. It's nah. I, I don't I'm, even know if it's that. Though, Scott. Against it. I, I feel like some of them are almost, and this is going to sound terrible, I think, like some of them are almost waiting for it to happen. Like, they almost can't wait. They want it for, to <laughs> for, the re- for the reason to boot. I mean, and the thing is, the one thing I want to do here is is make sure that we don't fall into that lazy narrative. The same way we do when, you know, when, like, somebody throws a pyro and it hits a fan and you go, oh, they're no really Rovers fans. They're, mm. they're probably Rangers fans that are there for the day. Some of the folk that were booing have been going to the Rovers for a long, long time, home and away, and have been going through a lot worse times than this and still cannot get perspective. Like, the, there, there are a few of them that need to take a genuinely long, hard look at themselves. There was, there was shouts in the first half of, change it, Murray, this is pish. I mean, come on. We are, we are joint top of the league at that point because we've got a point in the bag at that point. You know what I mean? We're joint top of the league with, what, seven games left to go? And that's the shout that we get. We've got two midfielders in, in defence and change it, Murray, this is pish. Like, just didn't come back. Like, I, I'm not being funny. I'll take 1500 at a home game. I'm all right with it. I'll pay. Do you know what? Make 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 it £30 to get in. I, I'm all right with it. Have, a, have an aptitude test to be allowed to go. I'm all right with it. Um, it just frustrates the life out of me. Like, these guys, oh... I mean, it's just yeah. the thing. I mean, it's not, I was saying this to, to, to Nalco, my wife, when we left the ground, that at any level of football, you're unless you're talking about like Celtic, Rangers, Man City, when you've got that kind of gap between you and the rest, mm. you're not going to go out and dominate and boss mm. and batter teams for 90 minutes every week. You know, even like you look at the, 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 the top leagues around Europe, you don't get teams like, you know, your Aston Villas and your Tottenham's and these kind of teams. They don't go out and dominate for a full 90 minutes. It just doesn't yeah. happen. You know, you know, like Scott says, they're, they're, they're boys that are, are playing at the level they are. They're doing exceptionally well. We've had a fantastic season. If you didn't have a Dundee United in, in the league with the record they've had, most seasons this points haul would be enough to have you well clear. We're doing a terrific yeah. job. We're doing a terrific job with the resources that we have and with the, 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 the investment that we've had. But we're not going to go out there and boss and dominate teams every week because it simply doesn't happen at any level of football at all. Well, also, exactly the same thing um, could be said for Dundee United. Aye, absolutely. So I was just going to say the, 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 the sack Goodwin thing, right? And I'm all for it because I think he's an absolute goon. But, <laughs> and, and it annoys me because they're not giving us any credit whatsoever. It's like in any other season, United have already won the league with the points tally and the games and the goals that they have. The only reason is that we won't go away. We will not leave them alone. Do you know what I mean? And it's that thing of, like, ah, oh, yeah, sorry. Like, we're we're really only annoyed. five points off Dundee's championship winning total last season. That was exactly barring, what I was 
barring an absolute disaster, we'll finish with more points than the champions did last year. Yeah. Um, so it is that. It's that. It actually works both ways, both for ourselves and Dundee United, that if not for the other, we have ostensibly played well enough to win the championship most years. Yeah. Um, and, and whoever finishes second has to almost try and kind of take that belief into the playoffs. Uh, and it's very difficult to do, and it will be very difficult for whoever plays second going into the playoffs to try and take the the positive mentality from that rather than the negative mentality of having been so close and, and missed out. And, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see how Dundee United do cope with that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but ah, it's just, I don't know. I, I, I find, it's, it's you said it, Blair, about like the people who are waiting for it to happen. And it's like, you've got to let yourself believe. What's the point otherwise? I don't understand the the mental... There must be easier ways to spend your Saturday afternoons. Like, I mean, Ian Lato said it months ago, didn't he? Like, if you can't enjoy this, <laughs> like, you're in the wrong place. Because <laughs> this is this is pretty much... And certainly, I mean, I've been going 30 years. Barring that one spell in the mid-90s, this is as good as it's ever been. Yeah. Like, this is, this is the good it. old days. Yeah. Would you, we've just not fast forward to the left yet? Like, totally. Um, and I mean, look, well, there, there, are, there are other places to go. Like, you know, it could get better than this. But I mean, history will tell you that it probably won't. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then not to let, you know, myself be kind of captured by the, the negativity. But fundamentally, like, this is. Aye, exactly. Like, if, if you've been going for 25 or 30 years, you know, which I have, this is the best it's been. So to be there and be like, I, I don't know, I, I wasn't going to mention this because I actually think it's so ridiculous that it, it doesn't bear mentioned. But somebody last night at full time, uh, yesterday afternoon, shouted embarrassing. It's like, compared yeah. to what? What is your scale? What else it's is so on that and scale? And where is the needle mm-hmm. on that? Like, in back, a nil nil draw away from home where you've played well. Like, and you're top of the league, joint top of the league. Maybe, maybe they were shouting at the fans that were booing. I hope so. I, I don't <laughs> think so, but I hope so. No, that would I be, so I mean, that would be a much more um, palatable reaction, a much more understandable yeah. reaction. But like, I don't know. I don't know what your, your threshold for embarrassment <laughs> is if that ranks in like embarrassing. It's just, um, I mental, really, is, is the only word for it. Absolute, just madness. Um, and I, 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 I can't, I can't kind of fathom that, that sort of mentality. I mean, that quick to leap to, like, oh, the you know the world's over, everything's everything's a nightmare. It's all a disaster all the time. Like, it's like these people have never been to like lower league Scottish football. Like, uh, but it is, lower league says, Scottish the, the, football the, is literally, it's there is a little bit. You will find some quality in it, but it's banter. Literally <laughs> the whole season, it's just. Just pro- everyone's a laugh, and everyone's it's serious for ninety minutes. But at the same time, after the game, you just go, "That was a good laugh." If like something happened that was quite ridiculous in the game, or a manager just went torn to it someday, or whatever, it is literally just that's why you see it all over Twitter. Just every week, there's something ridiculous that's happened in the lower leagues. Aye, and it's, it's, you could almost understand it more if it was people who had just like, "Oh, that team's winning. I'm gonna go down to gonna go down and watch it," but. It's as you say, Blair. It's you, you. You see people, and you're like, you. You're you're here more often than I am. Like I am absolutely every <laughs> game I'm at. You are here, and the few games I miss, I presume you are also here. You'd think just from that, like exposure alone would like um, <laughs> kind of soften out the highs and lows of the the thing. But listen, people wear their hearts in their sleeves, and there, there's no their defense as well. Um, probably from from years and years of watching the Rovers, we have been conditioned to hate ourselves, like. <laughs> I mean, that's the only reason you go on a Saturday, in it is is like some kind of weird self punishment, kind of penance type thing. I don't know. I don't know. It's the only thing I can think of. Aye, Either that or that it's sick. being so conditioned to just the the incessant negativity of getting bodied every week, and you start winning, it just doesn't feel right, and you're you're desperate to get back to what you know, maybe. But listen, there's no point where I'm ever going to say that people aren't entitled to their opinions and all that kind of stuff. But equally. Um, Have them quiet. I think I'm entitled to think it's ludicrous. Put it that way. <laughs> um, 
But that that probably um, I think kind of rounds us off for uh, for yesterday. Unless there's any any other kind of stray thoughts, any final additions on that. Perfect. So that then um, brings us into next week or the the week to come. And um, a nice little change of pace, um, very worthwhile change of pace. Uh, Wednesday night, we have um, Lewis Vaughn's testimonial game, which should be it should be a good laugh, uh, as as everything else invariably seems to be. And um, Hibs, I caught uh, Nick Montgomery um, on the radio yesterday. They were asked about it, and he says he'll bring out a young side through, but he is actually also just hoping to play. <laughs> like and it, it just sounded like that was in his voice. He was like, "I hope I'll play." Just, I'd like to, <laughs> I'd like to get a game as much as anything. I think David Gray uh, is going to play as well. And it sounded Murray like said the same Murray, thing. Didn't very I, much I, the same. I, yeah. yeah, it was yeah. like, "Oh, me and Mickey are keen, but we need to find out if Lewis wants us to play or not first. <laughs> just like having it's it going. Two managers half each other in a fifty-fifty. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like the idea of the, the gaffer having to go and chat the players' door to see if he can play on Wednesday night. <laughs> um, but it'll be good. I mean, uh, I think, was was Dave McGurn's testimonial, was that the last, the most recent testimonial? Yeah, no, um, Davidson. Davidson. Oh, I was, that was after that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I missed it. I was really gutted. I missed Dave McGurn's. I was away. Um, but it was at that one where, <laughs> where John Greer entered the field of play to conduct an interview mid-game. Um, With Alan Walker. Where he offered yeah. him some pies. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, I say this for John Greer. You say whatever you like about him, he's brave. Yeah. Uh, but so, I mean, it'll, it will be um, it'll be a good laugh, if nothing else. And it uh, should be interesting as well. I mean, it seems like um, Ian Murray's keen to get some minutes into some players who haven't had, you know, so many recently. Um, the players that are out on loan will be coming back as well. So you'll get to see the likes of... Um, and Arna and Adam Mass and these guys as well. Um, anything? I'm going to say this. I was going to say I'm going to say this now because I have to. I have to get it out loud because it's it's gnawing at my brain. So we're seven games from the end of a season in a title race, and we have a free week. So we're having a testimonial for our our longest serving player who absolutely deserves it. A very injury prone <laughs> player. Seven games from the end of the season. Am I the only one that's really scared? Really scared that he, like Nick Montgomery is going to end up two foot in Lewis Vaughan at some point in this game. Like it's going to descend. And okay, I mean, I'm fully expecting Sam Stanton to turn up ready to play, like in full kit. <laughs> no, Sam. No, you are not allowed to play. But I mean, Vaughan's going to have to play. Him. Yeah, but Vaughan's going to have to play, surely. And like, if if they don't put Scott Brown out there just to run around protecting him at all points. I'm going to be raging. Because could you imagine? That'd be the most Rovers thing did, ever for Lewis Vaughn uh, to pull up. Who did we play for Davos again? Was it Hibs as well? It was Hibs. Yeah, it was a pre-season aye, friendly did though. Did Davos not only play like 25 that's minutes right. and then he loops? Aye, that's right, because Breakin said they didn't want to play. I did the same with Vaughn. Aye. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he didn't play for us anymore. That was a problem. But he it was, was a Breakin. pre-season friendly. Yeah. He was at Breakin, aye. It was a pre-season friendly though, so it was played as a pre-season friendly, as all pre-season friendlies are at a slightly lesser pace and all the rest of that. Like this is going to be good fun, um, absolutely yeah. good fun. But I am so scared, so I scared. Am. I'm not expecting uh, blood and thunder in this one. I think no. uh, I think there could be a couple of boys out there with their baffies on for uh, <laughs> for large parts of this game. God, I hope um, so. I reckon you'll probably see, like, uh, even though it's a young Hibs team, you'll probably see guys like. Um, Paul Hanlon and Lewis Stevenson playing if they're fit. Yeah, because Lewis has been on the bench most of the season for Ibs, and Lewis is a, a is a boy for Kirkcaldy, well known in the Rovers fan base as well. That he was a Rovers fan growing up, so even him coming back, I know that he'll have probably spoke to Vaughn in the build up to this as well and saying, look, uh, that Hibs are probably happy to come and do this because obviously Lewis is a, a Hibs fan growing up, so. No, fair play that they got the game and whatever, but yeah. I am I, I'm not as scared as Blair is, but <laughs> that, so that is at the back of the mind of <laughs> only play him for half an hour, then give him a reception and then just get on with Guy and Cor and Miguel yeah. and all and it sounds like we're getting all the lone players pretty much a lot of game time as well from what Ian Murray said. So I think Calm Hanna, Arnett and um Masson will probably be playing as well. I reckon I reckon that 
Hibs should let us use Lewis Stevenson for half of this game because it will tick off a whole number of boxes for everybody. It benefits everybody. So, you know, this thing about Lewis Stevenson being a Rovers fan growing up, he can play a Rovers game. However, with it being a friendly, it won't then go on his Wikipedia, so he still just gets the one club man entry. Everybody who kind of has been talking about Lewis Stevenson coming for the last decade gets to be like, oh, we're right. But then, you know, ultimately we don't get him. Then Liam Dick comes back in for the rest of the season and Graham's happy. So this benefits everybody. <laughs> I, th- I think the only thing would be, um, with us not having a game this week anyway, there would probably be some sort of bounce game that would take place. We'd just never never hear about it. Maybe, so I, yeah. I don't think it's, it's that much kind of added risk. But obviously, as you say, the fact that we do know about it... Um, does Scared. just kind of dial up the <laughs> dial up the rovers meter, just to, yeah. um, uh, really. Just I mean, to this is this fate. is Lewis Vaughn who basically relegated us once for Dumbarton, <laughs> and is now is now seven games from a, a championship winning side playing his testimonial like it's the most rovers thing ever. Yeah, hopefully, just just by saying it out loud now, we're kind of I hope getting so. that out of the way. Um, I feel better. Well, listen, we've never made a single successful prediction up to this point. So uh, for us to do it now would be, <laughs> would be a real a real turn up for the books. So, You're right, I feel um, much better. What do you think the team lineups going to be? <laughs> <laughs> Aye, well, I'll tell you what, we'll give away two t-shirts for this one. Because <laughs> hopefully there'll be a few kind of guests and um, Aye. reappearances and all this kind of stuff that you normally get I'm for a so. testimonial. and. Um, Hopefully, a nice, uh, nice kind of decent crowd for that as well. I don't know if they've announced the kind of race TV um, for mm-hmm. it yet. I would, I would hope again that that would be covered just as an extra, an extra kind of revenue stream. But um, tickets are on sale, though, guys. I mean, genuinely, like, get, if you can, if you are available on Wednesday night, if there's anybody at this club who deserves the support, um, it's Lewis Vaughn. So get yourself down to Starts Park. It's been good to see 100%. as well on Twitter and Facebook that hey, Hibs have kind of been pushing it this week as well. Like Hibs have obviously realised that Vaughn is a Hibs fan and they've went, yeah. well, look, let's try and support the guy. And they, Everybody in Scotland, Scottish football now knows about Vaughn, uh, even after I think it was like his third one, his ACL, that everybody started to realise, right, this guy's getting nail up whatsoever. Like, it just absolutely nail up and I've said it a few times, my dad said it a few times, when you look at that Scotland team these days, I'm sorry, yeah. but Lewis Vaughan with no ACLs is playing for Scotland at some point when you've got Kevin Nisbet, Lauren Shankland, Lyndon Dykes, who have all played Scottish Championship and League One within the same time that Vaughan was there. And I think that Vaughan might not be the goal scorer that Shankland is, but he's certainly a much better player than he is. So I think... Uh, I'm not being too ridiculous by saying that I think it would have been in with the show because uh, he still wouldn't be playing for us if he was uh, mm. without them as well. Aye, definitely. That's it. I mean, so the tickets for this it's um, fifteen pound for adults, five pound concessions. Um, so, yeah. Hospitality is completely sold out, but there, there's um, plenty of tickets in the stands, and as you say, we hopefully get as many people down as possible. If anybody's on the fence for this, I think there is absolutely only one way to come down on it. Um, you know, you will not find a more uh, a more worthwhile recipient of a a testimonial mm. for the Rovers than Lewis Vaughan. Um, Be good if they start announcing some players as well this week that are because I imagine there's going to be he's been at the club a long time. Like there's going to be a few former teammates are going to be rocking up to to celebrate with them kind of thing. So um, I'm quite looking forward to the social media dinging off this week. Hopefully with so and so announced to be arriving on Wednesday to play in the game kind of thing, which will hopefully drive up the tickets as well. Aye, definitely. And um, we will have an episode kind of uh, back end of this week. I don't know exactly when it will be to, um, yeah, do a, I mean, I, I'm, I'm hope, hopefully a more lighthearted uh, review of that game. <laughs> um, it could be incredibly somewhere, depending on who else is, is involved and what else happens. But on the assumption that everything is absolutely fine, nobody does anything stupid, we'll have a, a nice kind of look back on that. And I think it sounds like um, plans are afoot for that just, to become uh, as it should be, just that a kind of Lewis Vaughn sort of tribute episode, and yeah. there'll be kind of favourite moments and all that kind of stuff that we'll um, we'll go over. Um, particularly with no no game at the weekend, we've got plenty of time to um, devote some uh, 
yeah, very worthy time to that. Uh, but I think that will kind of bring us to a close for today. Uh, so thank you, gents, for for joining me. Thank you, everybody, for for tuning in. Um, as you say, hopefully see as many people as possible. If there's any kind of undecided, anything at all, get yourself down to Stars Park on Wednesday night. Bring friends, whatever else, because um, there is as absolutely nobody um, more deserving than Lewis Vaughn. Um, as you say, we will be back uh, at some point, kind of towards the end of the week. And then after that, we'll get a proper preview for a, a huge game at Tannadice. And just um, cross our fingers in the meantime that Duncan Ferguson can actually do someday a bit of good for once um, when his side take on Dundee United before then. So as I say, thank you again, and we will see you soon. <laughs>